Thank you. Welcome everyone to Ohioana Book Festival Virtual Edition, LGBTQ Plus Stories. Uh, we'll give it just a couple of moments now for more people to join and for everyone's audio to connect. All right, I see it's three minutes after four. Shall we get started? Sure. Again, welcome everyone to Ohioana Book Festival's virtual event today. Uh, and welcome, uh, thanks for joining us for our LGBTQ plus stories fe featuring Meredith Dench, Ken Schneck, and Kristen Lipian Lipianka. Um, before we start, I just wanted to give a huge nod to the Ohioana Library Association and their staff for creating this marvelous virtual book festival. I'm sure many of you are aware of the longevity of the book festival and have loved attending in person in downtown Columbus. And uh, Ohioana staff persevered and created this virtual event. Um, the festival runs starting today, so hooray, Friday, August 28th through Sunday, August 30th. And I think we'll probably drop a link to the virtual schedule in the chat here. Um, I'll do introductions in a moment, but just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you uh, probably see at the bottom of your screen a, a Q&A section option or a chat option. Our esteemed authors are asking that we put question, your questions along the way in the chat feature and we'll keep taking a look at those and do know that we'll have a Q&A section at the end so we can interact with the authors. So without further ado, I'm so excited to welcome our guest authors today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more. Uh, Meredith Dench is the author of the Loose Hansen thriller series from Bold Strokes Books. Cross, the first in the series, was published in August of 2015 and was the runner-up for the 2015 Indie Fab Awards in the mystery genre. Her novel Cross was also awarded the Nancy Dasher Award in 2017 from the College English Association of Ohio. The second novel in the Luce Hansen series, Forsaken Trust, was published in May of 2017, followed by Dead Eye in July of 2019. Dench's short fiction and nonfiction has appeared in literary journals such as Haydn's Fairy Review, Ben Studies Quarterly, Lumina, Gertrude, Tahoma Literary Review, and many more. 
Her short essay, South Carolina 2012, was nominated for the 2020 Pushcart Award by Tahoma Literary Review. Dench was one of the founding associate prose editors of the literary journal, Camera Obscura, Journal of Literature and Photography. She's a member of the Sisters in Crime Buckeye Crime Writers and is a board member of Mystery Writers of America Midwest Region. Dench holds a Bachelor of Science in Special Education from Ball State University, a Master's in English from the University of Dayton, and a PhD from Texas Tech University in English and Creative Writing. Uh, she currently resides in Dayton, Ohio, and lectures at the University of Dayton, where she teaches composition, literature, and creative writing. Welcome, Meredith. Hi. Ken, Ken Schneck is an author, professor, radio host, and rabble rattler. His travelogue, Seriously, What Am I Doing Here? The Adventures of a Wandering, wandering and Wandering Gay Jew was published in 2017. LGBTQ uh, was published in 2017, pardon me, in LGBTQ Cleveland and released in 2018 in LGBTQ Columbus, hit the shelves in 2019 and LGBTQ plus uh, Cincinnati just came out in June 2020. He is a frequent contributor to the Huffington Post, Cleveland Magazine, and Freshwater Cleveland, and currently serves as the editor for the Buckeye Flame, Ohio's only statewide LGBTQ plus publication, hooray. For 10 years, he was the producer and host of This Show is So Gay, the award-winning, long-running radio show podcast. In his spare time, he is professor of education at Baldwin Wallace University. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. And Kristen Limpianca is the author of the Roxanne Weary Mystery Series. Her debut, The Last Place You Look, won the Seamus Award for Best First PI Novel and was also nominated for Anthony and McCavity Awards. She grew up mostly in a public library, hooray, and could often be found in the adult mystery section well before she was out of middle school. Her writing has been selected for Shotgun Honey, McSweeney's Internet Tendency, Grift, and Black Elephant. She lives in Columbus, Ohio with her partner and two cats. She is represented by Jill Mar Marsal of Marsal Lion Literary Agency. So welcome, Kristen. Oh. Let's get started. I'm so excited about this. An Ohioana featuring this LGBTQ plus stories event is one of the kickoff events of the festival. Um, I thought it was worth kind of uh, describing or reading the description of this event um, that you've seen in the schedule because I think it sets the tone for the questions and the kind of dialogue we're going to have today. So for too long, the stories of the LGBTQIA plus community in Ohio have been untold, silenced, repressed. With the passing of Ogre Buffel and versus Hodges in 2015, uh, and it's an Ohio thing, hooray once again, and the legaliza and its legalization of same-sex marriage, doors have slowly begun to open. Join our authors who write fiction, do podcasts and videos, as you've heard, and speak publicly about their own LGBTQIA plus stories, and we will discuss how more of those stories can be told and more uh, voices amplified. So Ken's bio says it all, and you all do it. You're rabble rousers with your pens. Let's start with Kristen with your Roxanne Weary Mysteries, um, and then Meredith. Uh, you both write edgy thrillers. Um, tell us how liberating it's been to share your, your LGBTQ plus voices with the world, and maybe talk about some of the frustrations. Sure. Um, I think that with the mystery and thriller genre in particular, uh, it hasn't always been kind to the LGBTQ plus community. So there have been a lot of um, not well written LGBTQ characters featured in mysteries and thrillers, books, TV, all of that. So being able to write a sort of well rounded, um, well drawn out, fully developed person who just happens to be queer has been really rewarding to, you know, be able to put a character like that out there into the, um, the genre and also to just sort of get people's reactions to it. The reactions to the Roxanne Weary series have been really, really positive. And when I hear things from people like 
you know, I've always wanted to read a book about a character who was like me, but I didn't know where to look or I didn't find one. Uh, it just means the world to hear that because like those are definitely the, the people that I am writing for, for sure. Yeah, I would echo everything that Kristen just said. I mean, one of the best things about publishing, I was really nervous about publishing my book. Um, and it was, it was really liberating for me to be able to um, like talk to people who came up to me with the same type of thing. Like I've always wanted to read about with a main character who's a lesbian and a, you know, where do I find these books? And here they are. And that was one of the frustrations that I really had growing up. Um, I grew up before the time of Amazon. So it wasn't like I could just go to Amazon and type in for a search word, you know? And so for me, it was really, really important to put books out into the world where lesbians were the main character. Um, and, you know, so that people could find those. And so when people come to me and say that they've been hungry for reading these books and now they're here, it's the best compliment in the whole world, really. Sorry, I can't hear you. I did it again. Oops. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Not to unmute. Um, I said that's great to hear. Thanks for sharing that. And Ken, you're uh, doing some more uh, podcasts and kind of um, nonfiction kind of work. Uh, tell us how liberating it's been for you to share your LGBTQ plus voices and some of the frustrations you might experience along the way. Yeah, sure. I mean, my, my first book is, is, is about, is a travelogue of my wacky adventures in the world. So I would like to say that all three of us write edgy thrillers. Uh, <laughs> really the case. Uh, yeah, in, in putting together the LGBTQ Cleveland, Columbus and Cincinnati books and just covering the past 60, 70 years of LGBTQ life uh, in, in our big C cities in Ohio, it's been incredibly liberating for me. Uh, it's, it's history that as someone who's not from Ohio, I've lived here for seven years, it's been incredible to speak with the people who lived through struggles and triumphs um, and, and all these cities are so different from each other and have such different LGBTQ histories and struggled with, with really different sources of drama. Um, so for me, it's been nothing but liberating and really validating. Um, and it's been amazing to just get the feedback from even people who have lived in these cities uh, their whole lives uh, who just didn't know the struggles that were going on behind the scenes, both in the LGBTQ community, within the LGBTQ community, and then in the world at large. So um, no struggles on my end. It, it's been nothing but an honor to put these stories out there. That's really great to hear. And what I'm hearing is the hunger is growing from your readers um, across the state or your listeners in the case of podcasts. People are, are wanting to see themselves in your work. And it's hopefully a more comfortable open space for all of us. So on that note, Meredith and Kristen, how, why, and when do you decide or feel you uh, want to infuse queerness into your fictional characters? Uh, Meredith? Well, I would say that my um, my main characters sort of come to me um, and they come to me the way that they are. And so these characters generally show themselves to me as being queer. Um, I don't know if it's because of who I am and that's why these characters tend to come to me, but I don't feel like I force them to be anything that they aren't. Um, so I try really hard to just let them be who they are on the page and then show them, you know, as, as Kristen was talking about, like these three dimensional, trying to show them as real people with real problems and all those kinds of things. Um, so because of who they are, I think that queer issues tend to come up with my characters a lot. And um, my particular character, Luce Hansen, um, she identifies as lesbian and she is, she specializes in um, tracking serial killers. And so um, most of the crimes that she's looking at aren't necessarily related to anything that has to do with queer life. I mean, the first book did a little bit, but it tends to bring up other issues in her own life that sort of mirror that with um, queer issues and things like that. So I think it's more just who they are and that's where these issues arise. I would really agree with that. I kind of just follow around my characters and see what they do. It's not so much that I decide what they're going to do. Like they're, they're in charge for sure. Um, and I think that that's really kind of like why I write what I write is that, you know, I want to write queer characters who are 
living their lives. And these are not specifically stories that are about the queer experience in terms of the plot of any of the books in my series, but the entire book is about the queer experience because it's through the point of view of someone who perceives the world that way. So uh, it's definitely just like what feels right and natural as I'm writing, like they just sort of dictate to me what they want to do and who they want to go home with and you know, all that good stuff, so. Thank you, and Ken, since much of your work is maybe, is it fair to say current events based and nonfiction, how do you decide on what LGBTQ plus topics and fabulous impactful queer people to feature and when? Yeah, I mean, I am first and foremost a, a professor of racial justice. So I'm always gonna be looking uh, at intersectionality and people being able to bring their whole authenticity, uh, whether, it's, whether it's through the Buckeye Flame, whether it's through uh, the LGBTQ uh, city books or even, even my own travelogue of just bringing all parts of myself forward neurotic and otherwise I was gonna say and otherwise it's all it's all neurotic uh, but I, I think it's really important that that we be able to feature people um, and and amplify the voices that that don't just exist in sexual orientation but um, that we're differentiating that it is a different experience here in Ohio uh, to particularly right now to be a black trans woman and what that means as opposed to my being uh, a, a gay white Jew from New York City relocating to Cleveland. Like those are two categorically different experiences. Um, and, and we're just seeing habitually that, that still we have to remind people that there are more gay people in Ohio than white gay men in Columbus who are lovely people, I'm sure. Uh, but there are others, there are, there are other voices that, that need to be amplified. We need to make sure that those are at the table as well. Um, and that we're really fighting, fighting for those voices to be amplified. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, as a queer man, I hear what you're saying, and it's so great. And I, I like to talk about how we're not just looking at a spectrum of all voices, but an absolute circle, because we want to hear from everyone. And, you know, we flip on the television now, and just Netflix itself is exploding with lots of uh, reflections of our, our beautiful communities all together. And I can't help but say, like, let's celebrate our neuroses. For too long, at least in my life, I felt stigmatized or repressed. And hooray, none of us are perfect people, and let's celebrate who we are, right? Right. Well, but we're seeing that even in the coverage right now. We, we actually just put out a story yesterday about uh, Cranes here in Cleveland. The Business Magazine just did their inaugural list of LGBTQ notable executives, which is wonderful to get LGBTQ voices in a business magazine. And then they put out the list of 21 different faces and the list is 95% white and 0% transgender. Um, and so we really want to push back and, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't take my own advice of pushing back on the panels that we're on to make sure that they are representative as possible uh, and, and that they're not all just white cisgender faces. And so we all have uh, parts to play in that within the community as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I think that segues into the next question, which is kind of rooted in systems or tradition. How have the publishing world and social media environments been supportive of all of your work? Um, Kristen? Um, yeah, I think when I um, went about publishing the first book in my series, like I kind of, I knew that there would be changes that my publisher wanted to make. And so I had done some thinking like what are changes that I would make versus wouldn't make. And like, I was sort of thinking before I really got to know my editor, like I, I thought, oh, I hope no one asks me to make um, Roxanne not bisexual because that's part of who she is. But I sort of anticipated that that could be something that was brought up to me just because there isn't specifically a genre for bisexual mystery. It's a kind of a very narrow window, but um, no one asked me to do that. So they've been incredibly supportive. And I think that, you know, the social media has also been such an amazing way to reach people who didn't know that this kind of book existed. Uh, and that goes for both, you know, people who've been looking for a mystery featuring a queer main character or a, a bi main character, but also for people who maybe have not encountered queerness in a meaningful way, except through the pages of a book. And if my book is one of the first to really let them inside the, the point of view, the perspective of a queer woman, then like that's an incredible honor. So that's really um, something that I'm very excited about. 
it's great to hear. I managed a fiction department in our public library for years and genres are so, and the way a book's fiction is marketed is so restrictive sometimes by genre designations and how books are marketed. I think there needs some work on that. It's true. Well, I mean, there's, there's definitely like um, the idea of gay and lesbian mysteries, which is sort of like a small section in some bookstores or a small section in some libraries. Um, and that's not where those books belong, although someone may be looking in like a, a queer section and be interested in a mystery. There's also plenty of people who are just looking in mystery who would be interested in reading yeah. such a book. And so therefore giving, you know, the mainstream support and the, like the mainstreamification of putting these books with the other mysteries is just huge. So um, I'm really happy that my publisher has been able to do that. That's good to hear. Thanks for sharing. And Meredith, uh, what's been your experience in the publishing world? My experience has been really positive as well, too. Um, I publish with a small indie press um, that specializes in LGBTQ um, literature. So they've been incredibly supportive. Um, but I think that, like, other than social media, like, that's been my main way of sort of reaching people who might not know about these books otherwise. Um, I do have to kind of echo the thing that Kristen is talking about and you're talking about of walking into a space where, like, especially we have a lot of um, chain bookstores in Dayton and going into there and there being like no representation for any LGBTQ books or maybe they have a section with like three historical books in it or something along those lines. It's really, really, that's been my biggest frustration about um, places particularly around here. Um, but libraries have been, my public libraries have been one of my biggest supporters. They've been amazing in asking me to do workshops and featuring my work and things like that. And so the library does tremendous work, at least in my area, with featuring LGBTQ books and writers and all of those kinds of things. That's great to hear. And Ken? Oh, yeah, nothing but good things. And and I, I don't think I would have even remembered to thank uh, the libraries. So this is really helpful. And, and I have to specifically shout out the West Lake Library here in, in the Cleveland area has been amazing, uh, amazing supporters. And, and those have been my, really, my most treasured and positive experiences have been with the libraries. Um, yeah, I, I think that my experience probably disproportionately was great because of the amount of privilege that got me in the door. Uh, the, after I wrote my travelogue, um, Arcadia Publishing was looking to start their an, an LGBTQ history series uh, for various different cities. Um, and, and they called it the LGBT Center and, and said, you know, what gay authors do you have? And for some reason, my name was the only name which that came up. And that's ridiculous uh, because there are so many incredible LGBTQ authors uh, here in the Cleveland area and in Northeast Ohio. So I think very much, you know, the, the, the privilege that I wield uh, in the world got me through a lot of doors. And so now the key is, uh, and, and in particular with the Buckeye Flame, how can we present an opportunity uh, for voices across Ohio, LGBTQ voices across Ohio, to be able to publish their words with the most minimal of obstacles. Um, and, and we often, we often, we've been around for seven weeks, uh, but often over the past seven weeks, we uh, have people just reaching out saying, here's a piece that's been rejected over and over from some more mainstream press. Is there any way you would look at it? And no, we're not gonna look at it. We're gonna just publish it. Uh, and these are your words and, and they're important. So passing it on has been a, has been a big piece of, of, of my work in the, in the journalism world. That's really good to hear about the networking and support of others. So that leads me to ask Ken, what feedback and engagement do you experience with your readers and listeners? Um, a lot, passionate, um, I, which I appreciate. Uh, I, I need to probably be better about when I take it in because uh, I'm not always in the optimal place to receive the feedback as passionately as it, as it is given. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't pretend to ever be able to achieve the representation that will be adequate. And so I really appreciate the, the constant uh, feedback, again, more so with the Buckeye claim uh, of saying, well, what about Youngstown? You know, where is Youngstown? And I don't know why I'm picking on them, but there's someone in Youngstown who keeps writing us and asking us. And so it, it's about really 
doing exactly as you said, doing that network, um, and also working with people on on self promotion. You know, uh, I, I think that we're probably not doing enough to to support each other and in, in how to create that perfect elevator pitch that that isn't maybe pages long, uh, but is a couple sentences that that can help us get at well, how can how can we we amplify you um, by knowing your story really quickly. So. Uh, it's been an it's been an amazing it's been an amazing opportunity. The feedback has been wonderful, um, and uh, it's only going to get up probably more intense. Um, apparently, there's an election coming up. Uh, <laughs> how we go about uh, covering covering that um, in a way that that brings in all voices is is going to be rough, uh, but I'm excited for it. I, and I was going to touch yeah. on something like army. Yeah, well, with the LGBT city books, that's been really fun um, because I was super nervous about putting them out there. And I think I'm good that Cleveland, Columbus and Cincinnati, I think I'm done. Uh, I was really nervous because of, it's not my history. And so hearing back from the elders uh, that, that we largely got it right, um, there were little tweaks along the way has been incredibly validating because uh, this history was disappearing um, as our elders age out. Uh, so that that has been... It was me really holding my breath, and in particular there in Cincinnati, where it is uh, the most passionate LGBTQ people I've encountered in the state. Uh, and so hearing back from them that they felt that their extraordinary history with, with um, issue three and article 12 and everything that went down in Cincinnati over the years that really affected the LGBTQ community in, I, I, I can't even wrap my mind around it. And I know the rest of us around Ohio just don't even know, really can appreciate what happened there. So hearing from them that we that we got the history right was, I'm good. I'm done with those city books now. I'm retiring on that one. That's fascinating. Yeah, Cincinnati's been quite a laboratory over the past decades. Yeah. Yeah, and I was gonna say a silver lining of COVID is there's no ignoring, we must amplify all voices now. And I think that's rising to the top of the importance to listen to others and amplify voices. Yeah. Meredith, what, what are you, how, how are you receiving feedback and engagement with your uh, readers? Um, I've been getting really great feedback, which has been really helpful. And um, a lot of, most of them have contacted me through social media or through email, things like that. But yeah, I've, I've had a, I've had my share of really positive things too. I cannot, I, I've been very, very lucky and I appreciate that for sure. Yeah. I think that one of the things that's most interesting to me being an Ohio writer and I've lived here the majority of my life, except for when I was in grad school, I left and then came back. But I think that it's really interesting how the experience of um, being LGBTQ is very different where you are in the state of Ohio. And I'm not so sure, I mean, I don't know, I, I can't say I've lived in a whole lot of states, but I'm wondering, you know, it's very different. My experience is very different from a lesbian who's living in Columbus or one who's living in Youngstown and things like that. And so I always find that incredibly interesting that a lot of the, when I get the feedback, I'm always very curious where someone lives and what their experience ha has been. Mostly I portray really small towns in Ohio in my books. And so it's always really, it's a curious thing for me to, to talk about or to know that. That's fascinating. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And Kristen? Um, yeah, I would say that I too get most of my, you know, feedback from readers through social media or people writing to me on my author website, which I always uh, really enjoy hearing from, from folks that way, uh, especially if they're, they have a comment of like, you know, I've loved mysteries my whole life, but I haven't read a book quite like this before because, you know, I've read a lot of mysteries with straight protagonists. Um, so that's really amazing. I think that sort of to echo what Meredith was saying, like there is no one queer experience, of course. So what we, what we do is we sort of just write our, our take on it or our character's take on it. Um, and I think that sort of going into it, that was something that I, was a little bit worried about just because like you know what's true for me is not necessarily true for another person in Ohio oh boy here's the cat <laughs> I think it's cat time <laughs> it's cat time <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, so she's been like threatening to jump for like the last 15 minutes so it happened <laughs> 
but um but yeah so you know when we when we write it's not like we're saying this is the way it is for queer people everywhere or queer women even you know queer women in ohio queer women in columbus have a different experience and queer readers know that for sure um i think straight readers maybe not necessarily but like what we're doing is adding our voices to this genre to the world of books and to sort of like help people understand that there are so many different experiences and points of view that people can have. Yes, let's expand the circle of safe and supported and celebration far and wide. Right? So Meredith, how do you intend to propel queerness in your writing ahead and perhaps even in your writing and community engagement? Well, I think the, the the one thing that I have been thinking about the most um, has been about like intersectional, intersectionality that Ken was speaking about and ways of incorporating different aspects into my characters' lives. And so, I mean, right now, or what I've been working on a lot lately has been disability, characters with disability who are also queer. And um, I think that I think that's sort of the way that I've been sort of edging into kind of expanding the way that I write about it. Um, yeah. And my speaking engagements are usually panels. So um, I'm hoping that we have some more panel opportunities that sort of mix some of these different areas together too. Yeah, that's could good I, to hear. Could I say something about that? I love that we're having this LGBTQ panel, of course, but like when you attend big in-person book festivals like in the crime fiction world there's a, a big one called voucher con and there's you know a, a smaller number of queer writers than there are straight writers and often we will sort of be bundled into just queer panels instead yeah. of having that representation across all of the panels which is really something that i think you know should change because like as much as a queer audience wants to hear just about queer issues it makes no sense to sort of only place queer writers in those conversations rather than, you know, having us be a part of the conversations in general. I hear you and I think that's very welcome feedback. Yeah. And so Kristen, uh, how do you intend to propel queerness ahead? You've touched a little bit on community engagement. Any thoughts on your writing or? Um, well, I think that I will continue to tell stories that feature queer characters because that's just like, you know, when I'm thinking about a potential idea, it's sort of queerness just comes bundled as a part of it because of my own identity. And so it's just, I can't imagine writing a story that didn't feature that element as far as the, the characters go. But I definitely think lifting up other voices in our genre, especially, you know, voices that maybe don't have the support of a mainstream publisher the way that I do. Um, sometimes, you know, I'll do something like, oh, I wonder what's a good, what's a good example of this type of book by a queer author. And so I'll Google like queer crime fiction. And it's like very disturbing to me to see that some of the top results of that Google search are pieces written by me. And it's like, this is not like a humble brag. This is me saying like, why aren't there other people writing these posts? Why isn't there more out there? Like, I'm not the only person who's had this question. So it's just sort of like, you know, why isn't, why hasn't someone who, you know, has way more experience as a writer, way more education than I do writing these posts, you know? So it's just sort of like, we, we all need to be spreading the word about other queer writers as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, good to hear. Ken, what's ahead for you? Uh, the Buckeye Flame is my life now. Um, and I accept <laughs> that and I embrace it and I'm excited about it. Um, and so, uh, I was previously the editor of Prism Magazine, which at the time was was the only uh, LGBTQ publication in the state, um, other than what's coming out of Kent State University. And there's a student publication. They do great work. It's called Fusion. Um, and then uh, COVID took its toll on Prism and all the advertisers pulled out and uh, they pulled the plug on Prism. And I'd always said as the editor of Prism, I will never, If I said to the publisher, if we ever go completely online, I'm out. Uh, I have no interest in doing that. 
So now I'm the editor of an online only publication um, and I oddly love it. Uh, it's, it's been so wonderful to, to get it out there to all of Ohio and to see the readership uh, more broadly than that. And we only traffic in, uh, I, I received some cautionary tales and people pushing back saying, take the word Buckeye out of there so that you can be more national. No, thank you. Um, our trade is LGBTQ Ohio, that's our brand our lane. Those are the voices we're looking to feature. We certainly will cover um, national stories as they come up, um, but through the lens of how they affect LGBTQ Ohioans in this state where, sure, maybe we now have um, employment non-discrimination based on the, on the Supreme Court case, but we are still living in a state where I can get kicked out of a restaurant uh, for, for being gay or kicked out of my housing. So we have no protections in housing and public accommodations uh, where we cannot get a Fairness Act passed, where there are two bills on the floor right now of, of the state house in Columbus, uh, one targeting trans athletes athletes and one targeting LGBTQ youth. Uh, so going out of their way to, to victimize the LGBTQ community. Um, so we have so much work to do in this state. And, and I, I am a believer that, that the more that we can get these stories out there and attach narratives to uh, bills, then it really will make a difference. So um, this is my form of activism. I'm not the guy, even though I'm a New York City guy, I'm not the guy who loves being in, in, in a protest crowd, but I will write the hell out of a piece on a protest. And that's my way of doing activism. Uh, so I'm really excited for people to, to get to know the Buckeye Flame more and what we're doing there. Because uh, it really is, it's a board of LGBTQ people uh, from all across the state of Ohio. 50% professionals of color and 60% women, and not just one token trans person, right? We really have amazing representation uh, to really make sure that we are getting the stories out there that affect all LGBTQ Ohioans. Absolutely, I think what we're seeing with this year of social unrest and everything, activism is not just an urban issue or, or an issue of particular geographies. It's something that we all need to be vigilant about, talk about, share about, and listen to others about. And I, so I did have a question, uh, what LGBTQ plus realities need to be addressed? And you've all just really touched on that already through, woven throughout our conversation today. Um, but I, I think I would like to hone in on this question, which Ken and others have touched on a little bit. Um, we think the well-being of trans folks of color and the everyday danger, just absolute danger they face is a huge issue that needs to be better understood and reckoned with. So what are your thoughts, starting with Meredith, about providing safe, what conversations need to be had? What actions can we take? What can we learn from others? Well, I think first and foremost for me, like showing those actual realities in my books um, or my characters experiencing or coming across those very real situations is one of the best ways that I can bring attention to it and bring light to it and the characters' reactions to it. But I also work at a university, so I work with young people quite a bit. And the discussions that we have in our everyday classroom, I feel are activating a lot of the things that we're talking about here. And things that the students haven't necessarily talked about or thought about so much. I have a lot of the students that I work with, the student population um, is very, very straight and very white. And so they might have a friend who's gay or something like that, but they haven't necessarily thought through the issues that are on the table for so many people in our country right now, particularly people of color. So that's where I tend to focus my attention. Um, a little bit like Ken was saying, like he wants to be the behind the scenes guy, like writing the article rather than being out in the, in the situation. Thanks for those powerful words. Uh, Kristen? Um, yeah, I would say that expanding like opportunity and access for other writers, first of all, to like queer um, trans writers of color probably need more support than a, a queer, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous, this cat. <laughs> Whoa, okay. Um, so, you know, making available some of the opportunities that 
I have, I've been given mentorship and so on is important, but like Meredith was saying about writing, um, the realities of these types of dangers that, that face characters. Um, it's really important to do that in a way that is not sensational because for so long, you know, mystery and thriller books and television have relied hugely on sort of this idea of the, the trans character who, you know, um, like for example, I was watching, rewatching the show ER recently from, you know, 20 years ago. And there were multiple storylines of a trans woman who winds up getting ovarian cancer. And it was like the same storyline. It's the same storyline. Like we need to tell different stories that are better, not just these same sorts of devices. Like you can use storytelling to shed a light on real problems, but it's also really important to not just default to the easy version of the story to sort of do the work to figure out, you know, what's at the heart of that story and to really represent the community um, realistically and in a way that sheds a light without sort of, you know, shining a, a glaring spotlight on stereotypes. Thank you. And just a real quick, uh, I wanted to point out uh, for our guests, please take a look at the chat because we're dropping in uh, links to all this, these great uh, resources that we're talking about here. So Ken, uh, more thoughts on issues that we need to reckon with? How can we expand understanding and save and supported? Yeah, I have been rewatching ER. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm at the point where I'm reasonably confident I can put in a central line, um, but <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm always going to push back against the word community. Um, the word community is a beautiful thing, uh, but when it when it follows the word LGBTQ, I think it doesn't have the complexity that that, that we should really yeah. play there. Um, I think it implies that we're we're lifting up each other in, in ways that we are not always doing. Um, and, and I think Columbus is a really great example of that and, and a lot of the friction that has happened there over the past couple of years. Um, so it, it's for me, again, I have this privilege. Uh, I, I have this privilege of, you know, and I, I think Meredith's point is just so important too in that, in that university circle. I'm a tenured full professor of education. There is no more security I could have professionally. And so if I'm not using that privilege to stand up and say, hey, that is problematic. Like the dress code that you just put out there to dance students, that was problematic. It was extraordinarily gendered and right. So I'm just always trying to push myself and, and I succeed you know, sometimes, uh, but more often than not stumble and, and need to push myself more to, to really, issue some clarion calls within the LGBTQ community uh, to be using our privilege where we have it to lift up others within our community that don't. And my cat was not interested until. <laughs> <laughs> so great, great, thanks. I think we've started something here. Yeah, I feel kind of left out. I don't have a cat, you know? Uh, <laughs> doing on this panel, Meredith. <laughs> <laughs> And to our guests, um, we're not exactly coming to a close yet, but we're going to move to a Q&A section in a moment. Um, uh, if you do have questions, please type them in the, in the chat and we'll be happy to interact and discuss with those. So with all this being said, any points of reflection or anything else on your mind, uh, vision ahead for your writing, publishing, podcasting, what else is on your minds? I really want Meredith to get a cat. I don't understand. <laughs> so, Meredith, are you are you opposed to getting a cat? Like, can you? I am not. I am not okay. Opposed. If you can Great. find me a kitten, we'll talk. Oh, okay. kitten. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my well, cats I'm... are my family. Definitely, they're my family. I have two. Yeah. Okay. To just sort of add on what I was saying a moment ago about you know the way that queer characters or trans characters are portrayed on television. Um, in a lot of cases, that is the way that people learn about different identities for the first time. Um, if you've seen the documentary on Netflix, Disclosure, um, they talk a lot about that, about how there's these specific types of roles that 
trans actresses sort of get cast in and it's like you can't you can't blame someone for wanting to work but it's also like it's like these are the types of stories that teach people and that's really powerful to like you know go into someone's home through their television every week or whatever um it's impossible to think that some of that doesn't get absorbed and so that's sort of where society in general can wind up with these ideas and that's something that creators of all types just really need to be mindful of and to take really, really seriously that, you know, the stories that you're telling have the power to not just entertain someone, but to shape their actual point of view on the world around them. Yeah, I think that the mentorship piece that you both have mentioned is, is just super important. And, and the more, if people are in a position where they can provide mentorship, um, is a wonderful Clevelander, Elaine Schleifer, who, who's on, who's the president of our Buckeye Flame board. Um, and she put up a post a couple of weeks ago that just said, you know, I, I'm actually realizing that I'm not mentoring any LGBTQ young leaders right this very second. And so if you know anyone, recommend them. And I thought that was just a beautiful thing to see of she's in this position where she can provide that mentorship and provide that access. Uh, and so putting yourself out there in that way then yielded a, a ton of recommendations. So if you can help foster that next generation, it, it, it's really, really great to do. And, and when I say next generation, I mean next generation of writers of people who aren't currently writing. Those might be our elders as well. Um, so I don't, I don't tie that to age. I just tie that to how can we get more people writing from their experience? The voices, the collective voices and hearing, I'm particularly interested in hearing from the elders in our community mm -hmm. and the things that they went through and um, collecting their stories, I think would be a phenomenal feat. Phenomenal. And I'm particularly interested in intergener conversations that provide intergenerational understanding. I'm, my personal experience, I'm kind of in the middle and I've had a queer folks older than me that tell their stories that obviously are so different than younger people. And I, I hate ages and so I'm just gonna throw that out there, but I think you probably hear what I'm saying about experiences of younger people in social media, it's just entirely different. And I think there's space for us to learn from what we experienced in different decades along the way. You know, one point is Ken touched on legislation over the years and how it's changed and uh, improved in many cases, but there's so much need for understanding of civic action ahead uh, with younger generations. I'm obsessed with intergenerationality and, and how I don't think that's something we do very well as a community. And it's where we always want to highlight that that ageism works in both directions of just, mm -hmm. right? So of, of young people saying, well, their, their experience doesn't apply to us. It does, but it's also elders saying, oh, I, I have no idea what they're talking about. And they haven't lived through what we didn't, they haven't lived through the eighties. And so what do they know? It's finding that common ground because when I've seen those opportunities come together, it's, it's just been a beautiful thing. Yeah. But we have to work on that in our community. One thing that is interesting about um, young people specifically regarding publishing is that if you look at sort of middle grade and young adult novels that are being published now or that are forthcoming, the, the breadth of identities that are represented is just staggering. And when you look at adult books, it's nowhere near the same way. Like you don't see it to be common to have non-binary characters in adult fiction, but in young adult, it's very, it's very commonplace. And the most exciting thing about that is that young people today are going to grow up reading those stories and they will come to expect it in their stories eventually. Uh, and I think that's really inspiring. Definitely. And a question just came in from David Weaver, our beloved director of Ohio Anna Library Association, which is an interesting, it's interesting timing. Every writer was a first was first a reader. What kinds of books did you enjoy growing up? Uh, did you enjoy reading while growing up? Was there one author or book that made you say, yes, I'd like to follow this path of writing? Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a, and I'm gonna actually combine it with a question that came in earlier uh, about advice on how to represent LGBTQ perspectives. Um, oh, me is everything. Um, there is no greater asset I have than authenticity. And so I remember everyone encouraging me, like, you just, you have to read David Sedaris and you have to read David Sedaris. And I read David Sedaris and I didn't, I didn't take to 
it. I, I, it's not demeaning of David Sedaris. It just, it didn't resonate. His words didn't resonate with me. And then I stumbled across David Rakoff uh, and David Rakoff's work. That was when the skies parted and the rays came down and the rainbow uh, filled me. Uh, and that was the type of writing that I was going for of just um, throwing yourself into ridiculous situations and just writing it from it from the most authentic way possible. That if you are, are feeling like, what am I doing here? Then say, I have no idea what I'm doing here. And I think the times, my most unsuccessful writing is when I try to be something other than I am. Uh, and, and the reason that I'm so proud of, of, of my travel log is because I just let it all hang out. Here's what I actually journaled as a gay Jew in, in Uganda, having no business being there and not knowing what I was doing. So um, David Rakoff was huge for me, but the asset was always authenticity. For me, I'm would... oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Oh, go ahead. You can go ahead. <laughs> um, I was not a really big, I didn't really enjoy reading when I was a young child. And I mean, I did it and I, you know, but I didn't really get the bug for it until I was in middle school and found Stephen King. I, I wanted to be a horror writer more than anything else in the world when I first read Stephen King. And his book, It, was really the one that sort of changed everything for me, reading about these kids and how these kids were portrayed on the page and, you know, all this other stuff. And so I always go back to the way that I felt the first time I read a Stephen King book. Um, it, it just changed everything for me. And it also helped me to see, you know, that my experiences is Stephen, one of the things that helped me when I was younger was reading about the experiences of people who are on the outside, whatever makes them on the outside. It didn't matter to me. Reading about that viewpoint was really, really helpful. So I was a huge horror fan. I loved, I still love horror, still love it. And, um, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely the book that I would pick. Um, I fell in love with the mystery and crime genre at a really young age, the, the first book that I remember ever reading that was a mystery, um, very on brand, it was called Sam the Cat Detective. And it was about, yes, a cat who is a detective. Um, the books by Linda Stewart is fantastic. I highly recommend that anyone with a middle grade reader at home checks that out. But um, the, you know, the thing, the thing about mysteries that I think is so compelling as a reader and ultimately as a writer is the idea of like the you're solving a puzzle, so you have to put clues in. So it's really just like, it's like, not. I'm not saying that it's the trickiest type of book to write, but it just has this extra element of like, you can read it, but you can also, depending on your level of attention and interest, you can really sort of dig down into every little tiny clue that's being put in there. Um, and also just in situations of um, stress and intensity and violence, that's when people's true colors come out and so I think that these these types of, of books that are about very intense situations between people or you know between communities it's just some really very interesting storytelling so that's just kind of what I've always gravitated towards thank you and I'm sorry I missed that question um, and Ken touched on it uh, nicely so Kristen and Meredith as we come to a close do you have any more thoughts on the question that came in a bit earlier on advice how to represent LGBTQ plus perspectives for someone who's still new exploring their own territory or their own story and perspective? So I would say um, sort of like I mentioned earlier, there is no one universal queer experience. So every experience as an LGBTQ person deserves to be represented and you know, your experience or even as you're trying to figure out what exactly your experience is going to be, like it's 100% valid and it is, you know, the, the greatest gift we can do for our community to be authentic as Ken was saying and just really tell your story the most authentic way possible. And uh, even though there is no one universal queer experience, there will be elements that resonate with readers. Um, and that's just really, really important. Yeah, and for me, when I um, started writing fiction and starting to 
have characters on the page that were LGBTQ, one of the things that helped me the most was figuring out my own story first. Um, and so I don't know if you have any interest in right in trying to work with some creative nonfiction first and maybe trying to pinpoint what your story is because you say that you're, you're you're recently coming out. So maybe coming like working with your story first before it doesn't have to happen that way. I'm not saying that's the but for me that helped me a lot figuring out my own story first. All right, I think we're coming to the top of the hour and what a rewarding and memorable conversation. Thank you all for your thoughts on so many topics that, are, that will resonate in my mind and I, I do believe resonate with our guests today. So thank you, Kristen, Meredith, and Ken on behalf of the Ohio Library Association and yay, hooray, what a day, great day to kick off the Ohioana uh, Book Festival Virtual Edition. So everyone, please be sure to check out the schedule. Uh, the other exciting thing is this and many, if not most events are recorded and will be archived. So please share with family, friends, and your fellow, uh, fellow um, communities um, so that, that we can watch this and, and reflect on all the great things that we're talking about. And someone just added, thank you for the inspiring session and thank you for joining us. And the schedule again was plopped into the chat so you'll have easy access to all the other great events coming up. Um, one more mention from Ohio Anna, remember to buy the books, all of our books from our authors today uh, from www.bookloft.com. So thank you all. Uh, really appreciate your being here today and have a great evening and weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.